I'm Charlie Redding. I'm Charlie Redding. And I'm Claire Fudge. And this is the Tribe Athlon Podcast. The Commonwealth was, it's hard to put into words how amazing of a whirlwind experience that was. That was Jody Stimpson, and this episode is Commonwealth Gold to 70.3. Hey Claire, how are you doing? Yes, good, thank you. How are you and how's the recovery from COVID? Well, I think I'm through the worst of it. I think I, I've, been, I've followed very strictly the protocol that you told me I should do. So I've, been, I've literally just done my first swim, which is the first exercise since I tested positive. So that's day, I'm on day four today. And yeah, I think I'm through it and uh, I'm, I'm all good. How's your training going? Good. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, it's um, racking up, but it's, um, it's good. And we've got some good weather in the UK though, haven't we? So it's really nice to being outside and running and yeah it's lovely oh, it makes it so much easier to train when the weather's good doesn't it um, and when are you racing next uh this weekend this I'm weekend on it's like every yeah. weekend. where are you racing this weekend <laughs> every weekend i'm just doing a little race in dorset so um oh. on home on home territory um Excellent. so Excellent. yeah good, a good sea swim to sort the men from the mice um <laughs> i'm gonna have to do a strong sea swim now i've said that <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're all gonna be looking at your swim yeah exactly that's oh. going. yeah oh, really? that's it's a strong, strong swim is it <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> excellent well uh we're really pleased to be joined on this uh intro by erica from um 33 fuel so Erica, welcome um, to the 30, uh, to the Tribathlon podcast. Not even the, not the Thirty <laughs> Fuel podcast. Um, welcome, Erica. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's so good to catch up with you again. Obviously, mm. you were with Claire and I, and Warren and Kerry and James when we uh, when we did the uh, Arc Fifty back in January. So uh, it's it's great to see you again. Well, um, it was epic. You guys did amazing. I was uh, amazed. Really, really good, guys. Well, I think it came down to the support crew, actually. I think we had a lot of uh, a, a significant amount of help in that journey. So, uh, yeah. And actually, Erica, in in particular, you you were the person when uh, when we were back at the house that, were, that was actually making up all the uh, thirty three fuel recovery shakes and everything. So you know, you were you were great not only on court on the on the day of the race, but before and after as well. Yeah. I was trying to be useful, guys, <laughs> in the real work, you know, I, I would just uh, help you a little bit, but you did amazing. And, uh, you know, especially longer distance, it's uh, there is so much to prepare, so much to think, so much that can go wrong or, or better. So, you know, if uh, the support helps at the best, <laughs> that is, we are there for that. Oh, no, it, it really did make a massive, you know, I think it put us both at ease and allowed us to actually enjoy the race, um, despite feel, uh, feeling, I was feeling grotty then as well, wasn't I? This is a yeah. recurring thing. <laughs> I'm sure it's not related to you, Eric. Um, but, um, so, so I want, I wanted to just chat to you briefly a bit about, so you're, you're obviously, you're not doing triathlons at the moment, I don't think, but you have done triathlons and, and one race in particular, um, that actually uh, Jodie Stimpson, who we're going to come on to the interview of shortly, mentioned that one of her bucket list races is Alpe d'Huez. So tell us a little bit about the triathlons that you you did do when you when you were racing, but with particular focus to Alpe d'Huez, because it does sound like an amazing race. Well, that's a very funny because Alpe d'Huez was my first triathlon and is the one that basically I wanted to see Warren uh doing it and i said oh my god this looks so cool the weather was perfect you know everything was so amazing you see the super fit people i said i just really would like to do it one day and as soon as i said that warren was already organized he said okay <laughs> great you're going to do it the next one <laughs> so <laughs> next year you're doing it and i said I never did it. I never realistically, I always did a little bit of sport and uh, keeping fit, but was not actually never like 
triathlons. Uh, so I always swim a little bit, but you know. So that was my starting that I said, um, I said, that would be so good, but I was not super sure 100%. I was like, we will see. Uh, but then I went uh, out with some friends, which one is my sister and one is a, a very, very good friend, uh, Anya. And we basically were, we got maybe too many cocktails. I basically <laughs> make everyone join me. <laughs> it was the three of us doing it from zero. So from zero, all of us, we decided that was the adventure. And at the time, we didn't even add the, the company. We were not doing the sport nutrition. Uh, so 33 Fuel was not, uh, not even uh, an idea there. It was just not existing. So, you know, um, so that was, uh, was uh, very fun because uh, it did bond me a lot with friendship because, of course, uh, you are finding yourself uh, on, uh, you know, embrace uh, such a, a big race. And of course, before doing that, I did some triathlons of preparation like Blenheim, you know, the usual one that you need to do it. <laughs> At yeah. least transition, you know, all of these, these things so that you say, oh my God, transition, I can make it better. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, because it can actually take so much time to go from a place where finding again your bike, where I put my bike, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, you know, guys, you did so much that you probably forgot completely how sometimes is, um, it can be complex on <laughs> some, you know, especially transition. I don't, I don't think I ever forget how, how easy it is to fight, you know, make transitions complex. Uh, I seem to be very good at that bit. Um, <laughs> what is it about Alpes that everybody talks about that makes it seem such a special race? Uh, definitely. I mean, the iconic be so much. The, the bike, uh, it's to me, the bike was the best. Uh, the swimming is amazing because, uh, in any case, uh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful uh, swim. The bike uh, is an iconic. I mean, it's one of the Tour de France, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, stages. Stages. Well done. And uh, so realistically, if you wanted to do something like that, you want to be in one iconic. You, you can't, I mean, in my world, I was like, if I prepare for something big, it has to be the one, you know. <laughs> then actually, after that, after I did the Alpe d'Huez, I just continued because uh, it's, it's, it's just like a, an addiction. It became really a proper addiction. Um, but I discovered something. Uh, I always thought that my, I always thought to have a, a lot of uh, love for, you know, sw for the swim. But in reality, the bike, uh, and especially steep hills uh, like Vontu, because mm -hmm. then I started to do all of them. I think mm -hmm. that's uh, the best. I mean, I find them very satisfying. Mm. Oh, amazing. It's a, it's a beautiful race. Uh, there is a lot of support. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's, uh, and the French are very, very good on uh, supporting the races, you know. You make and what, what's the run like? Because you run at the top of the mountain, don't you? Yeah, the run, the run it was nice. It's pretty technical because in any case, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's nice. Uh, but I have to say probably the part that I did prefer was uh, the swim and the, the bike. Mm. The run is nice, it's definitely nice, but you know, the bike, you have so much uh, changing of altitude and it's mm. amazing. I mean, um, I have to say that to prepare that bike, I did one tour. And when I did one tour, I think that is such an enormous experience, especially if you never did a, a, a big mountain. Mm. And uh, we started down there, it was hot, summer went up, <laughs> the snow, there was so much wind that my bike, it was just like <laughs> sweeping away and uh, it, it was incredible, absolutely incredible. That was, uh, 
Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. I say it's definitely a race that is on my bucket list. That sounds awesome. I remember Joe Skipper talking about it um, and just saying what a brilliant race it was. Um, now, listeners that haven't that haven't sort of um, heard you speak before, Erica, will have picked up on your Italian accent. Oh. Um, and, and there's a lot of Italian roots within 33 Fuel as a business, isn't there? So I, I wanted to talk, I wanted you to kind of tell us a little bit about that, both from a, um, a, a recipe perspective and also from a naming perspective. So um, because those people that have seen things like your protein bar and your energy bar will have picked up on the Italian names that probably don't really understand where they've come from. So tell us a little bit about the Italian roots that you've managed to to weave into 33 Fuel. Well, yeah, the Italian roots. Here we have a, a kind of interesting combination in the DNA of the company. We have some 50% Italian, no, that's me. <laughs> 50% of water, no, that's English. So we find the right combination. So as you all know, the Italians, if it doesn't taste good or if it's natural, properly, you know, made, they don't even touch it. And it's like, no, thanks so much. I just, uh, you know, avoid. In fact, it's kind of interesting because for nutrition, uh, um, in Italy, a lot of, uh, uh, even pro, uh, they tend not to use a lot. Uh, the Italians one, they just use uh, maybe just uh, for the, the races, for sure. But because, I mean, um, the ingredients are a little bit uh, not so natural. I mean, they're not, not, not natural. So... Um, my Italian side, it brought in the recipe, the, basically the natural side, um, in the way that we were searching the best, you know, um, we are speaking about food realistically, the best almonds, the best, you know, uh, uh, ingredients that you can find in nature. Um, we produce here in uh, Siena, we produce uh, our bars, Energy Bar, Amore and uh, Eroica, that is our protein bar. Mm-hmm. Also them that we produce here and it's uh, all handmade, I mean, it's just like in the old days when you see the grandma, you know, preparing <laughs> stuff. We don't have grandmas, but we definitely have real people, you know, to do it. So it's... Uh, it's nice. It's like really going back in time. It's not uh, seeing machine that they mix everything or things like that. Um, so yeah, so we have the Italian DNA that uh, it brings definitely uh, the taste is important and the quality of the ingredients. Um, and we produce some things in, in UK and some things in, in Italy where I am at the moment. Um, enjoying the sunshine <laughs> <laughs> and, and the energy bar is actually themed around it's a very Ita- it's like an Italian cake basically isn't it it's absolutely yeah. delicious so I can't remember the name of that cake so talk uh, about that yeah the energy bar the name is Amore that means love and this was born uh, because uh, Warren and myself uh, we are married and uh, we decided to give a gift to our uh, customer uh, for our anniversary, wedding anniversary. So we decided to create uh, Amore. E Amore is a, a bar coming from uh, a very um, old recipe from uh, Siena, from this area. Um, and it's a, a cake that, that is being used uh, from hundreds of hundreds of years to fuel uh, um, warriors uh, you know generation to generation and so we thought you know what we just bring the, the same recipe changing a couple of ingredients to make it uh, you know with sugar a little bit of GI so you don't have a spike of energy and crash we add a little bit of superfoods inside but the taste is very very similar to the original uh, version and so Amore was born as a present uh, to our, for our customer. We sort of uh, share the love. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And what about the protein bar? Where does the name of that come from? Yeah, protein bar, it's uh, again, was born uh, again here in, uh, in Tuscany, uh, in Siena, because again, the base is uh, still uh, coming from the same uh, cake, basically. <laughs> 
uh, the only thing we change, we add a lot of proteins uh, because, of course, uh, is a protein bar. So we had to, to maximize the best uh, the, the protein for recovery. So each bar has that famous 20 grams of uh, protein that it's, it's good for, for our recovery after uh, workout. Uh, and the name is coming from an iconic uh, race. It's a very interesting race called uh, Eroica, uh, all on gravel on the Strade Bianche. So very technical. <laughs> I, I will say it's uh, proper, you know, it's, uh, it's very technical. And uh, the fun thing is actually it's going to be tomorrow. Tomorrow they are starting. Tomorrow, the day mm. after, it's a multi, multi-day race. Uh, there is the pro race and then the, the amatorial. And it's fantastic. Everyone, they dress up like in the 60s. They have to use very old bikes. Um, so they are more or less all at the same level. So there is no actually the advantage of the technology of the, uh, you know, uh, better bike, better suspension, better this. But there is nothing of that, you know. So, uh, no, it's a fantastic, fantastic race. Uh, and uh, it's very um, pittoresque. Oh. It looks like going back in time. Mm-hmm. That sounds fantastic. And um, what makes with the protein bar? I think is that the one that we tried when we were down in Cornwall. Yes. Yeah. Because exactly. exactly. so you, I know you've got almonds in there. What else do you add in then for the protein? Yeah, we would, we did uh, basically we have some rice protein and also we add some uh, um, white egg, you know, egg white uh, protein. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a combination between uh, egg white, uh, rice protein and almonds. Mm-hmm. But the almonds, we wanted to keep it uh, um, full because it keeps also the oil, the, the natural oil. And also it gives you that bite, you know, sometimes you need that bite mm-hmm. because the, all of these, uh, you know, gels and things that are so mushy, sometimes you need a little bit of something to buy. So we thought about it was a good um, good idea to, to keep it. In. And also they look so good. You know, almonds, <laughs> full size. Yeah. Nice. You see the quality. It, it, is a, it is a, they're both the energy bar and the protein bar are brilliant products because if you take them out of the wrapper and just eat them with a coffee, you actually feel like you're eating the cake from the coffee shop as opposed to a protein or an energy bar, which it's, and it's certainly the only products I know that, that fall into that category. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think that they're, they're absolutely brilliant in that sense. And, um, and just to wrap things up, um, are, are there any new products on the horizon? You know, we know that we know we love your protein powder and the, and your, and the bars that we've talked about and the, and the daily greens, but anything new? Yeah, in a very short time, guys, you will be the first one not to know this. <laughs> so in reality, yeah, we are working at the moment on a new product. Uh, it's going to be a, a very interesting product uh, um, that uh, it will uh, allow the uh, people to recover very well with protein because, it's, again, uh, the base is um, plant-based protein. This will be completely plant-based Meanwhile, the, the bar, we did the, the egg white. This one instead, it will be a completely uh, plant-based. And it's, um, yeah, we decided to, to go for more uh, uh, an unusual uh, uh, shape. And we went uh, for the shape of uh, a cookie. Uh, so it will be a, a recovery cookie. And uh, it's... Um, Again, going back to the Italian and Toscan tradition, uh, the shape is actually coming from a cookie from here. So <laughs> the, the team that they are making, uh, the cookies are handmade by the father of the owner of the company. So they did everything by hand. And I love that, you know, because... Is love that uh, little things that maybe no one will notice, mm-hmm. no one will know it, but we know it. And uh, for us, uh, is uh, is the quality is the, the first thing. Awesome! I like the sound of a recovery. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. 
I think that, that again, I like the, again, sitting there with your coffee afterwards and eating a recovery cookie, recovery cookie, <laughs> that is, um, yeah, that sounds like a great and idea. I, I tell you what, in this one, we are putting actually a second liner that will be feel the density. <laughs> excellent does that have a name yet uh no yet we are working on the name uh but yeah we are working on the name but uh, i get the feeling there'll be an italian name in there somewhere so uh <laughs> there would be there would be something italian but there would be different names here yeah, that we have different names coming and we are testing the name which is the best one you know so we are still working in progress uh, but i tell you what the packaging is already ready and again all the packaging we are making here in italy and uh, is all fully recyclable the phone for us uh, being uh, an ethical company, being, uh, you know, having fully recyclable packaging is very, very important. Uh, everyone should have it, especially if you're thinking about nature and sport. We all love sport, we all love nature, and we want to keep it at the maximum uh, and to help the nature to be more flourish instead of the opposite. Mm. Well, I think it's brilliant. I, I love the new branding that you've you've sort of rolled out on. I know I know the bars are where the new branding is imminent, isn't it? But I think it looks really good. But the fact that it's all recyclable is um, it is fantastic. Yeah, it's all recyclable. It's all printed here in Italy. We are trying to make everything uh, so the shipping is not too bad for because in UK they don't produce. Unfortunately, they don't print. Uh, um, packaging, recyclable packaging yet, or in any case, the one that uh, we need, uh, maybe other formats, uh, but not, not zip grip packaging. Um, so we were looking all around and I said, I can't believe it, in my country they are doing it. So yeah, <laughs> so, off we go. so we decided, yeah, that's great. And uh, so we are printing everything, uh, everything here. And as we speak, they are now in production, all of the new uh, packaging for Amore Bar, they are printing as we speak. So in a very short time, yeah. everyone exciting. can see it. <laughs> well, I saw a brief brief preview of Warren on Monday and I thought it looked really good. So I look forward to uh, just checking it tastes as good inside the packaging as the preview. I'm sure it, <laughs> sure it will do. Erica, it's been absolutely brilliant to catch up with you. Uh, I can't wait for recovery cookies to come out um uh, i'll be very excited to talk about them when we get to try them um but yeah keep, keep up the great work enjoy your time in uh, in italy and i think we'll now dive into the interview with jody stimpson Thirty Three fuel produce award-winning natural sports nutrition and everything they do is led by their philosophy for performance for health and for a fitter future 33 Fuel's awesome products have been fueling triathletes worldwide since 2012, as well as many of the world's best athletes. So from the England football team to Tour de France winners and triathlon world champions, including four times Ironman world champ Chrissy Wellington, who's been using 33 Fuel for years. 33 Fuel also leads sports nutrition sustainability with plant-focused formulas for reduced environmental impact, recyclable packaging, and carbon neutral delivery on all orders, which also got them rated as um, by Runners World as one of the top 50 eco-hero companies worldwide. Another reason why I love what Warren and Erica are doing at 33 Fuel. So to find out more about 33 Fuel, go to 33fuel.com, and if you use the code TRIBATHLON, or click the link in the show notes, you'll get an extra special discount uh, when you purchase your amazing stock of 33 Fuel. Jodie Stimson did her first triathlon at the age of eight 
and went on to a massively successful career on the short course, winning two Commonwealth gold medals and also being a four times winner of the World Triathlon Series. She's now moved up to the 70.3 middle distance uh, racing and has already notched up wins as well as some amazing iconic races. Um, so Claire and I got a chance to chat to Jodie uh, about the challenge of moving up to the longer distance, you know, from a nutritional point of view, from a sponsorship point of view, from a training point of view. There's so much impact that 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 makes. So it's really interesting to see what she's done to step it up to the middle distance. Um the iconic races that she's targeting, um, particularly given her sort of more flexible race selection nowadays, and also the massive disappointment of missing out on the Olympics, something she clearly worked incredibly hard for and came so close to. Um, I just love Jodie's enthusiasm for the sport. Um, she's clearly just, um, you know, absolutely uh, her heart set on triathlon and always has been from such an early age so there's loads of great advice in this conversation and i know you're going to really enjoy her infectious enthusiasm so um enjoy the interview with jody stimpson So Jody, welcome to the Tribe Athlon Podcast. Uh, we've got Claire with us as, as well. Really looking forward to chatting to you, finding out more about um, your successes over the years. Um, but I always like to kick things off by asking people to tell us a little bit about their story. Now, I know you got into triathlon at possibly the earliest age of anyone that I've um, I've interviewed. So tell us how it all started. How did you get into triathlon? Um, I got into triathlon really well. My dad taught me to swim when I was four. Um, and it was like a local swimming group called Albury, uh, which then got converted into Albury Swimming and Triathlon Group, which was basically me, my uncle and my cousin was the triathlon members in that group. And yeah, and then my uncle did Ironman at the time. Uh, is this, is this um, the person that was gets termed as Auntie Derek? Is, are we talking about the same person here? Yeah, so <laughs> when I was younger, the uh, the auntie and uncle, I don't know why, but I got confused with it. So he ended up being Auntie Derry. Um, and then obviously that stayed out throughout forever. Um, so he he's still Auntie Derry. Um, but yeah, so they kind of, him and my dad took me to my first like little triathlon where you did a pool swim and you kind of ran around a or cycled around a football pitch and then ran around the same football pitch and I did that when I was eight and back then it was called the milk series um and I share this with um the famous Alistair and Johnny Burnley because we kind of grew up in that scene together really and did the milk series and it was all across the country and uh, just these little triathlons and from then, I, I never wanted to do anything else at all. Like, I, I've, I've asked mum this, did I ever want to do anything else when I was growing up? And no, I always wanted to do triathlon from then. Fantastic. And how did that how did that progress through? Because, um, I mean, it's, it's brilliant that you found your element to steal Ken Robinson's terms so at such a young age. How did that then progress through... Um, from just doing the milk series up to um, your next success. So then from, from there, really, I kind of, I stayed at Albury Triathlon Club, um, but then I found um, my first proper coach really was called Steve Lumley and he coached out of Birmingham University. So when I was still in um, high school, I then went and kind of trained with the university group and, um, and stayed there until uh, I was 17 or so. Um, and then that's when I kind of made my first coaching change. But until that point, like Steve, had, uh, like I was really successful with Steve at, at, like at a young age. And but I needed a change. Um, and that's kind of when I went to uh, Michelle Dillon. And kind of from that point, that's when I really started to break onto the triathlon scene. Um, and my first year under twenty threes was really successful with her. I I won European uh, sec second at European champs, um, second at worlds, um, and then yeah, from there. And I think my real breakthrough though 
um, and my best years in triathlon so far um, were under Darren Smith and he was called D Squad at the time and that's where I share my best successes, Commonwealth Games, um, WTS podiums and training with a group that like contained Aileen Reed, Lisa Norden, Annie Haug, these big names in triathlon that kind of were all under D squad and yeah it was it was an amazing time in my life. Do you want to pick out a couple of the um you know obviously I'm assuming the common what Commonwealth gold medals were were um significant highlights um but also the world triathlon series wins. So do you want to pick out a couple of the of the moments that were you know had were the most memorable for for you on that sort of stage in your career? Um, I'll tell you my first, so my first, uh, my first memory, I suppose, it was the Kitzbühel race and uh, it was known as, um, so you basically, that was the one that you kind of went up the mountain um, and so that was the, one of the fondest memories was, it was unusual, it had never been done before um, and you kind of started normally kind of in like a lake situation and and then you kind of cycled to the bottom of the mountain and you basically the bike consisted of cycling from the bottom to the top of the Kitzbühel horn and then you did the runoff on the top of the mountain um and I kind I remember this one very very fondly for two reasons one of them was my mom doesn't watch a lot of my races she's there and she doesn't miss the races but she will give me a kiss good look at the start and then she'll go put her iPod in and she'll just walk around the expo because she's just too nervous. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this one was different. So this one, you have to get the gondola up the top of the mountain. Um, so she had no choice to watch it because she was stuck at the top of the mountain. <laughs> and I ended up winning that. And so that was the other reason to why that was a fun one is because the lead up to that, I was training in Morzine with the amazing, some of the amazing athletes that I mentioned. And I was absolutely getting my backside handed to me on all these sessions, these hill sessions, because in Morzine, you basically go up or down. It's, it's the Alps. And I was, I said to Darren before it, I was like, Darren, I, I don't think I should do this race. Like I, I like I, I don't think I, I don't think I can do it. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna make an embarrassment of myself. And he just said, I think you'll be all right, Jode. And yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad he said that because then I ended up coming away with a win. So, Amazing. yeah, that was that was a really fond, a fond memory of that race. Brilliant. And what was it like to um, to win the Commonwealth Gold? Which would you, if you could only have had the Commonwealth Gold or the the World Triathlon Series win, which would which would you have taken? Commonwealth Gold, hands down. Commonwealth. I mean, the Commonwealth was. It's hard to put into words how amazing of a whirlwind experience that was. Um, it is. We were kind of in our own bubble again before that race, um, and. Like we, I was training in Morzine before it. I'd, everything had just gone so well in the lead up to it. Like there was no session that was more important than another. Um, I was training at that point. There was just basically three of us. There was myself, Aileen Reed, who competed for Ireland, and Jess Broadwick, who was an American athlete. Um, everything just went well in the lead up. There was, I didn't feel any pressure. Um, I didn't I didn't find myself even though I went in as number one to me I wasn't the favorite because in Hamburg previously I'd been beaten by three or four Commonwealth athletes so I didn't see myself as the favorite going into it um, and I think then the race just went well like I was third out of the water I was in control on the bike and the run just just I was in control all the way and the one the 
the one memory I have of that is um, you kind of did like um, a behind the corner before you got to the blue carpet and the crowd was so loud that when I came onto that blue carpet that I thought I was in a sprint finish. So I absolutely killed myself on the blue carpet because I thought I was sprinting and there was no way I was looking back. And there's no one there. <laughs> I could have been, I could have enjoyed the blue carpet a hell of a lot more. But yeah, it was and then when I crossed the line, um straight away mum and dad was there and there's not many races where you just get to embrace like the people that mean the most to you and have been the most important in your journey. And that's what made it so special is that the grandstand was literally there. And it was, yeah, it, it gives you goosebumps just thinking back to that day. Amazing. And did mum manage to watch the whole race? I think she did. Um, but uh, my sister... Um, had not long had Erin was only little then my niece um, so I'm sure she was a good distraction for her for some of the race <laughs> how, how do you feel JD about co the Commonwealth coming to Birmingham as well because obviously you coming from the West Midlands it's just at the moment it's just kind of everything's going on everywhere all across the city and all the different venues so have you got any involvement within the Commonwealth Games at all in any sort of capacity or yeah I'm so I'm going to be doing the commentary um, for the race so it's amazing to be involved um, and I suppose in one side of me though it's slightly disappointing that I'm not going to be one of the athletes racing and I know I'm going to get you know the jealousy of like the girls that are on the start line um, but yeah it's, it just didn't fit in time wise it wasn't it wasn't I couldn't to be honest the swims just moved on so much in the short course okay and they're just swimming so much faster that yeah I, I think I can bite with the girls and run with the girls um but there's no point if you're not there at that top end of the race um but no I'm I'm definitely stoked to to be involved and where the triathlon is in Sutton Park I do my long run there every Sunday so It'll be pretty special to see like triathlon take over sort of part. Yeah, fighting. Why do you think the swim has become so much stronger in the short course? To be honest, I think triathlon kind of goes in, it goes in peaks and troughs of all different kind of like when I my best years is when you know the run was really the focus point. Like, yes, you had to be there on the swim and the bike, but the run was really the focus point. And I think we kind of always seem to to do a game change a year after the boys do it and I think you know Flora Duffy had a, and a had the she she was responsible for the women's change in focus that you have to you know be swim bike run dominant and you can't rely on a strong bike to get you back in the race because there's a strong group of cyclists up front and then you've got You've got Jess Learmont that's an absolute fish. And you've also got like Sophie Caldwell. I think the main change is that you've got a big group of girls now that can swim really fast and they're excellent cyclists and they can run fast. So in one way, it's great because, I mean, that's what we all want. We all, to win the race, you want to be the best swim bike runner. But there's always a balance, isn't there, of like, you know, being great in the water, maintaining great power on the bike, but then you've also got to be a super fast runner. It's the it's the balance of triathlon, and I think at the minute that swim is so important. And it may be that in a couple of years, even more people have brought up their swim, and then the run becomes more of a focus. But at the minute that lead pack is gone. That's really interesting. Do, do you, um, so uh, having seen how amazing Commonwealth Games were, um, what are your thoughts, uh, you know, what are your thoughts around not having an Olympic medal to add to, to that? Um, yeah, that that's pretty, that's pretty tough. That's, you know, all through my career, that's what I wanted. 
I wanted an Olympic medal. I wanted to be an Olympian. And unfortunately, it just wasn't in my career. And as much as I tried, I couldn't have tried any harder to, to get that spot, you know, to get the medal. Like, I, I really put everything into it. I couldn't have put any more. My life was committed to do it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's obviously upsetting and devastating that that wasn't in my career path but I've had to come to terms with that and I've had a successful short course career and now I'm putting all my energy into having a successful long course career yeah what's that, sorry yeah. what's that pressure like JD to be because we, we've talked to a number of um uh, athletes recently um about the pressure you know the pressure that you're under as a professional athlete um, what you know? What did that feel like at that time? Because I know that must have been you know during sort of selection time and things like that. And what does what does that feel like? How do you cope with it? Um, I think to be honest, in that period, um, Darren Smith, my coach at the time, he was amazing, and I didn't. The process of so I think that my my shot would have been twenty sixteen. That was when I was so close. I'd I'd gone into that year I'd won the first two races I was ranked number one that was that was going to be my Olympics um and to be honest that winter I didn't really feel pressure as such it wasn't pressure as oh god there's an Olympics coming or there's a selection coming Darren almost took that off and it was just about the process um and to be honest, I have no idea how he did that because it was it was amazing how we just had to concentrate on each day as it came, doing a good job. Um, and I think that's why I was the fittest I was going into 2016. Um, and it was just because Helen, Helen had an amazing race when she needed to and and I didn't. I, I kind of, and it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating, not only for me, for my family, for Darren. Um, yeah, it was, it, at the time, it was one of the hardest things that I, I had to go through. It's, um, I just, yeah, I just, I don't envy all those athletes out there, you know, the pressure that you have to put yourself under um, as well. But like, it, and now, um, obviously, you're moving on, aren't you, in terms of where you're kind of putting your um, time and efforts as well. I know, Charlie, you've got a number of questions about that. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, so moving through to, to um, 70.3, what I suppose the first things, what have been the um, biggest changes that that's made to your training? You know, tell us a little bit about um, that before we go into the individual races. I think the, the the biggest change that I have struggled with is so I've obviously ridden a road bike all my life and kind of going onto a TT bike like going in front of when I was ITU I, I would put myself as one of the strongest cyclists out there like in the ITU women's field and I just couldn't translate that power over to TT I just I, and to be honest it's only been the last six months working with my new coach that things have started to click into place and that's why I was so frustrated at the previous 70.3 I've just done because like everything in training has been yes this has changed yes it's moved forward um that's I suppose definitely going from a road bike to a TT bike that's been my biggest annoyance um because the actual training from Olympic distance to 70.3 yes some of the run sessions have to be a bit longer um the bike intervals have to be a bit longer and obviously you have to stay in aero um it's not massive amount of change like the swim program is probably the same um the run volume at the minute is low just because super nervous about getting injured at the minute so me and trust with my body at the minute is not ideal it's getting there but it's not ideal um but bike wise like I 
but you still need to have that top end. Um, just because 70.3's got so much faster at the minute, um, I think, which is a great thing for me because I love that head to head battle, I love that race, and I think that's why I wouldn't want to go any longer at the minute. Um, because Ironman becomes a different, a you know, whole different event. Um, and I think that 70.3 at the minute, you still get that head to head gripping battle. Mm. Um, so um, with the with the power on the bike, um, and you, so a couple of questions that that throws out. One is, was it you holding the aero position, or was it your power in the aero position that was the problem? And secondly, what is it that you think has kind of you said that that's just sort of started to click into the place in the last few months? What is it that's enabled you to to resolve that? So it's both. It, it was both. It was holding the aero position. Um, which I think initially I was set up wrong. I was set up, it was either too aggressive or just didn't suit me. Mm-hmm. And the power over, I, I, you use different muscles, like you in that time trial position. So, but I think it was more to do with the position that I couldn't, it wasn't easy to translate over. So I think that was a major kind of learning curve. So I've recently just come back from Boulder where I've had a bike fit with Ivan who has he's done numerous top end pros. Um, I really think he's helped me kind of translate it over. I'm not in a I'm not in a super aggressive position. I don't want to be yet, um, because I've got to get used to this first. And I think that's where I'm at at the minute. It, it's a process, and it's gonna be it's gonna be quite a big process. Um, but I'm happy with where I'm at at the minute. What you say really that so that's really interesting because I think I have the same issue in that I my when I cycle with my mates on a Saturday, I know which ones I'm stronger than and which ones I'm not. And yet when it comes to a TT bike. I know that I don't, I don't, I never seem to deliver the the power that I think I should do relative to other people. So, and I have had the full bike fit, but I'm, it makes me wonder whether I've gone too aggressive and kind of, yeah, it, it, that's really interesting. Um, so is there any, uh, any advice that you can give me that would be, you know, this is what I would look to do given the problems that you'd had? I mean, with me personally, I was just, I was set up too aggressively. And like some bike fitters, they see a TT, a, a TT bike and it's like, right, aero gains. And yes, there is a balance of, you do want to be aero because you will save more watts. But it, it's it's comfort at the same time. So yes, you want to be aero, but you've, also, you've got to be able to hold that aero position. Otherwise, there's no point in holding it for 10K when you've got 90k to hold it for yeah um so i think it's just it's very individual and it's finding the balance of okay how aero can i get but then still being comfortable and still active in everything to continue the power through the stroke and i guess being able to get off not i guess and getting off and running in running you know running running strong as well yeah i mean when i was when i had like the my first few races and I wasn't set up correctly I I could always run well off it um but I think that's I could always run okay off it um but then that's another thing at the minute it's like okay now I'm biking a lot better now my run I find well I'm still playing a little bit of catch up just from a few injuries that I've had but it's now the balance of now I'm cycling better. Okay, how does that impact my run? Mm. Oh, it's a whirlwind of triathlon, isn't it? But we love it. Like, yeah. it's <laughs> well, it's all about it's all about constant improvement, isn't it? There's always an area to improve, which is one of the reasons why um, triathlon is so fascinating because there's more. You know, there's so many different aspects that you can improve. Um, what's what's your so tell me a bit about what your entry into 70.3 was like. I think Daytona was a bit of a um, shock to the system, wasn't it, perhaps? And then also about your recent races, so particularly Miami and uh, Escape from Alcatraz. Tell, tell us a bit about the two extremes. 
So my first 70.3 that I did was actually Bahrain. It was uh, it was Ironman Bahrain, and I actually had a really good race. Um, I ended up in a, a foot race with Holly Lawrence, um, and she got me at the end. Um, but it was actually a really, I loved I loved the race. It was a, it was an awesome battle. I loved it. Um, Daytona, um, yeah, that was a shock to the system to say the least. Uh, I. I, I think I'd done six weeks on my TT bike before then. And I, yeah, against these powerhouses, like I knew that I'd get a bit of a ass kicking, but that was another level of ass kicking. Like it was just, it's a flat loop. Mm. You have to hold aero. You have to maintain power. I'd, yeah, I just, it, yeah, I was in all sorts, to be honest, by the end of that. And I just couldn't, hold any sort of power or form i mean it got off and i ran pretty well and i ran through um so the 21 the the, the 21k is never that's never really been the stopping point it's always been the bike which is frustrating because coming from itu i'd say that was one of my strengths um but then yeah i've obviously mixed it up and then recently i've done escape from alcatraz and i was lucky enough to get the invitation what a race is all i can say like anybody who's got a bucket list of races that needs to be added it's already it's already on mine i think i think claire <laughs> and i were talking last week and we said that needs to be on our bucket list <laughs> yeah it's amazing i mean what triathlon is it that you are put on a boat and you ferried out and literally the start point is like diving off this boat and swimming to shore. And I mean, it was so foggy that all you saw is these, like, well, I was trying to follow boys white water in the distance. Um, the bike course was like basically up, down, twisty, turny, like amazing. Um, and then the run, like the run, was an obstacle course of like so there was no concrete on this course you start on gravel you then go up 200 steps you go down steps you go then on to sand you end up doing this run on sand which is absolutely horrendous for anybody who hasn't run on sand and at the end of this sand stint you have a sand ladder which it's just like a dune, a sand dune that you have to try and get up. Like everybody, like hands on knees, trying to get to the top of this sand dune. And then you have more stairs to kind of go down before you get to the finishing bit. It, it's it's just it's oh, and in the middle of it, there's like this little tunnel that you can only just get through. <laughs> I didn't realise that on the run. No, I didn't. I Is that you just even more on my bucket list now? <laughs> it's just amazing. I think you you read all the course. This is why I just have to do it again because you so much I'd be so much better the second time because I know what's coming. Like I rode the bike course previously. I mean you can't really do the swim. Um, but the run you can't, yeah, you can't do, but it's just amazing. Honestly, everybody's just got smiles on their faces, like it's just pacing becomes irrelevant. It's just because you've got so many things to kind of conquer. It sounds like the 70.3 equivalent of the Norseman or Patagon Man or something. It, sound, it sounds fantastic. I can't, I can't derive about it anymore. It's, it's just, it's amazing. And, and Jackie, who ended up um, winning, um, she was just like, mission is to finish. Just complete the activity. <laughs> so, okay. And that was all that was going through my head at times. It was like, Jackie, complete the activity. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. That's yeah. it. Does sound like a fantastic race. Um, how was how was winning winning in Miami? Oh yeah, that that was emotional. Um, yeah, that was obviously that was the first trip that I'd done uh, since my dad had passed. Um, so yeah, that was and it was on. It was emotional for obviously numerous reasons that, and that was one of one of the reasons for moving over along as well um but that particular race um I was lucky enough to get mom out to come out with me um so it was emotional for her 
um, as well to because obviously they would usually travel together to these races. Um, and in Miami again, it was kind of very similar to a Daytona course that it was on a um, a car speedway, um, and Dad loved F one, so you could I could just see Dad loving the race how different it was. Um, he loved the States anyway. Um, he definitely got me through that race. And and that was all that I was thinking about was him. Um, so it was, yeah, it was definitely an emotional, an emotional race and to, to go through. Brilliant. Yeah, no, that's, that's lovely that it had, it, you could draw strength from, from, from difficult times. Um, what about how how is switching from ITU up to middle distance impacted um, getting sponsorship? Uh, struggled big time. Um, at at the beginning of my career, I always said that because I I don't come from a wealthy family. Yes, I've never wanted for anything, um, but if I wanted something. You know, I can't rely on them to support financially. Uh, I, I, they support me so much emotionally that it's ridiculous. But like financially wise, I, I can't. So I always said at the beginning of my career that if I can't make money from my job, then I can't do it because I can't. Um, and I kind of find myself a little bit in that predicament at the minute. Um, so I've obviously got some savings, um, but sponsors are very small at the minute. Um, I'm lucky to have uh, a guy called Sean Haywoods from Haywoods Transport, who is financially helping me at the minute. Um, but it, it's definitely a struggle um, at the minute going to long course. And I would I would have expected that to have started to ease now, given yeah. that you're starting to see some real um, success at this distance. But I don't know how long these things take to. It's, I expect it's like turning an oil tanker, isn't it? I hope it comes quickly. That's all I can say. I hope it comes. Quickly. I mean, yeah. I suppose that's the thing from coming from a short course. The short course, right? If you were to win and be successful at races, um. You can uh, you can earn a, a you know a good living, um, and you don't have to depend so much on sponsors, because race winnings are far better, um, and obviously racing short course, you know British Triathlon are, are you know a great federation in that way, and I was really lucky to be UK uh, lottery supported, um, so I wouldn't have to pay for travel and accommodation and the actual races. Whereas now I do like everything is I have to pay for myself. So, you know, medical cover, transport, traveling to races, the actual race entry, everything. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely been a massive, which I knew it was coming. Like I, I, I knew, but there was nothing really you can you can do about it. You just have to kind of hope the tides will change a little bit and some sponsors will, will come on board. Has it put more pressure on you from a social media point of view? Um, obviously, YouTube's growing massively now, um, and that's a that is a good way of of you know getting sponsors. But the people that are doing the YouTubes, um, they're quite lucky, as in like they've probably got some income already, so they can afford to pay a, a videographer. Or um, if you look at like somebody like that triathlon live, Paula and Eric, they do an amazing job. They, like their YouTube is great, but Eric is very talented, um, and Eric and Paula work great together. So a lot of people, some that they've got a couple, they've got somebody that can you know record or take more photos to get content for their social media. I haven't got that, so it, it, it's challenging. Like to, that's like, and in races, I'm really lucky to there's some great photographers there that will give you the content, so you can you know, put that on your social media and some of the kit sponsors that I've got, 
I, I you know, it's a way of giving back to them, hopefully racing well, um, but also showing them content wise as well. So it is, it, it, it does. Um, but hopefully, you know, my performances will start to, to help that. I remember Jackie Herring saying that, you know, there is in this day and age, a lot of pressure for social media. She refuses to, um, go after it she said it'll either be my results that do it or they won't you know it's not going to be the her social media so yeah exactly I mean I've, I've got huge respect for Jackie like, you know she's got a family and you know she was she was awesome to hang out with her at Alcatraz and she's you know she's really on fire at the minute but she's she has to balance her life I mean she's got two kids she's got you know she's got a life outside of what she has to do outside of her job um and she balances it and there's no room for YouTube in her life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I suppose I have to have that mindset of, I want my performances to speak the loudest because I haven't got the avenues of somebody to do the other stuff for me. So one of the things that I remember reading about you was that, um, like shifting up 70.3 one of the one of the attractions is that it gives you a bit more flexibility in terms of the races you pick and I think I saw you mention outdoors and outlaw and things like that how 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 much of you know what I suppose what races are you looking forward to um but how much does that it, that increased flexibility um help you explore triathlon more I think previously I would never have done something like the escape from uh, the escape from Alcatraz because it just wouldn't have it wouldn't have been able to fit in with the series. Um, so yeah, there is races like that one, these outdoors that I am definitely going to do in the future. There's still I I still think my priority is to race the best in the world, and to try and beat the best in the world ultimately so I want to go where they are that is a bigger plug to me which is why racing like the PTO events like the next one's coming up is Edmonton and then there's Dallas so they're a bigger um cherry if you like that I want to go and race because they give me the bigger buzz that like racing the best in the world and, and challenging myself like that but yeah, there is races that you know I do want to do. I I love I love racing at home. You do, at the UK give the best support, no doubt. Anywhere in the world, uh, we've got the best. You know, I've I received the best support, the best love around the course. So doing home races is great. So then after Edmonton, I'm hoping to do seventy point three Salford. Uh, it's not not Salford, um, Swansea. Oh, brilliant! Yes. So, you know, I, I love racing in the UK and that kind of gives me the flexibility to do that. Fantastic. And have you raced any of the Outlaws yet? I haven't yet, no. I haven't yet. Oh, well, I'm sure you will enjoy them. They are, they are good races. Um, what about, um, with regards to, as we've got Claire here, what's, what have your, has your approach to nutrition changed Um through um your switch up from itu to to um 70.3 uh to be honest this is a bit of a struggle at the minute um on numerous different numerous different reasons one of them is i have had some serious injuries some serious bone injuries which yep some of them i would say it's been to under fueling in the past as a younger athlete. Um, so now I find myself kind of, I don't know, I'm in the middle of kind of over fueling to make sure that's not the case. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a massive learning curve for me to just try and get my head around. Recently, for example, um, I raced 70.3 Eagleman and I race with Morton I think it's a great um I think it's a great product um because I I have gone through a period of having a sensitive stomach during races so three days out from or two and a half days out from a race I'll go no fiber 
So no fruit, no salad, no vegetables. And it absolutely kills me. And I feel like I've got the worst diet in the world. Um, but it helps on race day um, to kind of eliminate that fibre. So that's great. And I have like that pre-race and I'm happy with that. But then during the race, I think when you're going from like an Olympic distance, where it's like a two hour race, as long as you've fueled right previous and yeah, you've got carbs and stuff during, you can kind of get away with a lot of things, which is where I'm figuring out now that I probably got away with a lot of things in my career. And when I raced Eagleman, yes, okay, I've probably stocked up on carboys. I don't actually take any electrolytes. So, and I found that my, and I have, even in Miami, I had like tingling and numbing in my hands. Um, so is that a sodium overload? Is that a magnesium or, you know, potassium? Or have I just not got enough electrolytes? It's a minefield. It's an absolute minefield. And I think you just get found out, obviously, a hell of a lot more the longer that you have to go. Yeah. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because I was actually gonna um gonna kind of follow on from that in terms of, you know, with under British triathlon and the racing you were doing before, yes, it was shorter, but um obviously I know you have support or there is support from nutritionists within those teams. And kind of coming away from that, it's really different, isn't it? Like racing without all of that kind of support and like you say you can you can kind of get away with it on a shorter distance um but longer distance is is really really different um and it's just learning again isn't it um and and not having that support must be must be you know quite difficult did did you have much support from british triathlon from a nutrition perspective when you were when you were racing um short course yeah i did i suppose when i was with darren um he kind of took that and he he uh, he was a master at, at so many different traits in triathlon. Um, yeah, he, he, he was a bit of a genius. Um, so I was really confident in just kind of learning from him. And I'd say I learned a lot from Darren and I took that away with me. But when I was with British Triathlon, it was probably the last, yeah, it was, it was probably the last four years. It was... It was great in one way because that was the pressure was kind of taken. But did I learn a lot in those four years? No. Um, and I suppose then I'm, I'm grateful that I wasn't in that bubble um, throughout my whole career. Mm-hmm. Um, but the last, yes, I did have nutrition help and I, I could go and, and go to the nutritionist and, and ask and, you know, she'd say, this this and this um but I it's totally different going into longer distance Mm. and I still personally don't think that I got the best of myself in those last few years of ITU um yeah I I don't think I I got things right if I'm honest Mm. What do you what do you mean by that? What what looking back on it, what specifically would you do differently if you were going to go again at it? Um, I I think it mainly comes down to I learnt a lot when I was with Darren, and he basically when I moved to Darren, I'd done things totally wrong uh, with my previous coach. I'd underfueled, I hadn't recovered from training. And that driving force has always been performance with me. It's what do I need to do to get faster? And with the previous coach, it was just taught to me wrong. It, 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 it was just, it wasn't help. Um, so going to Darren, he just basically taught me to eat healthy. Um, and he, uh, the first camp that I went on, for example, with him was, uh, we all kind of shared this massive house. And he'd be banging on my door, like when it got to like three hours. And he'd be like, it's time to eat. And like, I don't want to. Like, well, you've had a stint of not eating, so you need to eat. And I'd absolutely hate him at the point because I was like, I don't want to eat. Like, But he taught me that your body needs fueling constantly. It's not just pre and post training. It's kind of everything else around it. You, When you stop training... Your body then doesn't need anything. 
Mm-hmm. Like it's a constant, you know, refueling and because you're always kind of going to be at a deficit for the amount of hours that like we train to the normal person. Mm-hmm. And I think that when the past four years then, I think everything just wasn't as easy. I don't know if it was because I was in this, the Loughborough bubble. Um, I had, don't get me wrong, I had an absolutely fantastic time with training with Sophie Caldwell, who is doing absolutely amazing at the minute, and Olivia Mathias, um, who is also, she just won't keep school on the weekend. Like, those girls were, were great to train with. Love training with them. Um, but I think it was just too much maybe being in that bubble. Um, and you didn't get to just learn i think it took away the feeling of the swim bike and run process a little bit for me like you you ultimately yeah okay it's just training but it's so much better to feel what you're doing it's hard to explain so where where do you think you'll find yourself um kind of next in terms of training and basing yourself because you're based in birmingham i understand at the moment yeah so yeah, based, based at home, um, but I've literally just got back from seven weeks in Boulder. Um, so I do think I'll be to and fro in from the States um, a lot more, mainly because there's, there's a load more 70.3 races out there. Um, so I'd be silly not to. Um, but I do think that like that kind of seven week period, it went really well. I, I really enjoyed it. I got some awesome training done. Um, I really enjoyed, uh, I did a lot of training with Flora. Mm-hmm. Uh, I swam with Judy Dibbins' group and Ian O'Brien's group, and they're just so welcoming out there. So, yeah, I do see kind of a split that I'll be kind of based out in the states and uh, and at home. Fantastic! That sounds like a uh, a good lifestyle. Were you at was was um, Sid out there um, while you were with uh, Dibbo's gang? She was, but only for like a brief time because it was before the world. Uh, okay. so after the world, she kind of went back to Girona. So I kind of crossed paths with her like a small amount of time. Brilliant. Oh, fantastic. Um, so I noticed that you've got an aura ring on your finger. Oh, yes. So tell us a little bit about what do you, what have you, why do you wear an aura ring and what, how have you found it useful? Um, I mainly find it useful. It, it's mainly because it was either between that or the whoop strap. And I am a person that can't sit with a strap on, but I don't mind the ring. Um, so I use it for resting heart rate, heart rate variability. They're the main two and sleep. They're my main things that I really try and look on. And it's quite interesting looking at heart rate variability, especially when I went out to Boulder, because Boulder's at altitude. Um, so I found it really interesting to kind of see what that was doing in different parts of training. And it was interesting because it didn't actually um, rise up to its average, my heart rate variability, before Alcatraz, and it definitely didn't recover before Eagleman. And it hasn't recovered yet. Um, So it's just quite interesting, like, to kind of track that. Um, And resting heart rate, even before the aura ring, that's how I manage, um, try to manage um, getting ill or overall fatigue or, you know, that that was one of the key things that uh, Darren used to get us to monitor is your resting heart rate. Um, so I find that really uh, important um, and sleep as well uh, I do I, I do look at the sleep and find that quite interesting because um, there is definitely a link between if I've had one night's sleep I can get away with one bad night's sleep I can get away with if it goes into two bad night's sleep that's when I need to be careful do you know what your lowest readiness score is? So your aura gives you you a readiness score of one to hundred, doesn't it? Um, do you know what your lowest readiness score that you've managed to get it down to is? No, but I can tell you. Um... So while you, while you look, I'll tell you my what. Uh, well, actually, mine is yesterday was mine was the lowest it's ever got down to, and that's due to COVID and combination of COVID and jet lag. But previous to that, 
um, it was um, the 50 mile ultra marathon that we ran in January and a day's drinking at Twickenham. Those were the two comparable lowest scores I'd got before COVID. But actually, it's, it's interesting that COVID has put me down significantly lower than those two. So my lowest readiness score was, so it was 50, 57. Oh, wow, that's not very low. Yeah, so I, I, I got down to 50 before COVID, and my COVID score was 38. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. low. Yeah. That's low. It's definitely telling me I'm not in good shape. In fact, it even asked me, do I want a rest mode? I, I've activated rest mode, which is, <laughs> which is recovery from COVID. <laughs> but it's, it is interesting how it, it knows that I'm in really bad shape. And I think what's going to be really useful is using that score to get me as I kind of ease back into training. I know um, we've talked, Claire, before about the kind of the protocol of easing back into um training after covid but i think that that's going to be a useful measure for me given that it already knows i'm currently in a pretty bad place yeah i think it's super important like that lowest score for me um i the, the, there there's two similar ones one was after after alcatraz and the other one was after eagleman and both of them was i mean 70.3 start early um so you don't get an awful lot of sleep the night before but then mm. the night of the race, I just don't. I really struggle to sleep. I just can't mm. sleep. And I've been out early for flights previous on, on both of them after the race. So you kind of miss two nights sleep. And then you go into travel, which is kind of the worst kind of checklist that you could go into. Um, so I've just, yeah, I definitely go into catch up mode of like trying to get back on track. But it is interesting, isn't it? Because that's giving you a score that you can then go, right, okay, I, I, I know I'm vulnerable for, for you know, picking up an illness or something. So actually I can, I know I need to be a bit more sensible at the moment and play catch up. Yeah. Um, Especially like, like you say, stepping on flights and things when you're in that situation, if you're racing kind of back to back or, you know, a few weekends apart or whatever, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really useful, isn't it? To, yeah. And of course you're more likely to pick up um, bugs on flights as well aren't you so COVID? yeah like like covid from portugal with me yeah well yes you definitely got yeah yeah so you got it from flight i'm not sure i did but um um i we always ask uh everyone that comes on the podcast jody for any books that you found to be particularly helpful to you books that you find yourself recommending if not books then podcasts or other things but is there any any books that you that particularly jump out at you that you found particularly helpful so I'm not a reader like I'm uh I'm dyslexic and uh, so I find reading extremely frustrating because I will read a page and then forget what I've just read so it, it just annoyed the crap out of me so I just I stopped reading if I want there was actually there was a few books that I read and actually remembered what they were or what I've read. Uh, it was Iron War was one of them. Oh, brilliant book. Yeah. What an amazing book. Um, that is amazing. Uh, both of Chrissy Wellington's books. Yeah, awesome. Um, and I think they're the three that I've actually like read and remembered what I've read. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, mentioning Iron War leads me on to a, a question that I was going to ask you is, is Kona on the list at some point? I've dreamed of, like, that has definitely been, like, the dream. But training for 70.3 is still a bloody long way. So <laughs> I can't really put my head in an Iron Man, to be honest. So not at this particular time in my career. Do I want to do an Ironman? Yes. Will it be to say I finished an Ironman or to then go and race Ironman? I don't know. But 70.3 is a long way for me at the minute. So I don't know. Um, but and, and actually, just one thing that you, you mentioned that you're dyslexic and struggle to read books. I am also dyslexic, but I just listen to books. So I, I found that when I clocked listening to books as opposed to reading them, it was transformative. So... So may, maybe give that a go. 
I do listen to a lot of podcasts when I'm out cycling on my own. So that mm. might be a good, because I know that Alistair's now that you can listen to. He's done. Yeah. So that might be, that might be a good, I haven't done it yet, but that might be a way to go. Yeah. Well, I, I listen, I, Relentless is, is Alistair's book that I think you're talking about. And that, yes, I listen to that rather than reading it. It's a good book. Very good book. Um, so yeah, um, that, that is uh, the way forward uh, for me anyway. Um, so one last question, and um, unless Claire's got any more questions she wants to ask afterwards, but um, what are you most excited about looking forward? Oh, um, finding me again in the long distance. That's quite, um, I suppose that's quite a personal thing, really. Um, I, I definitely found a happy place in ITU and, yeah, of course, everything's great when things are, are going well and successful and and I'm finding my way back again. Um, I think I was the most successful when I was just enjoying the process and um, I'm definitely getting my way back to the get there again with my new coach, Jodie Kunama. Um But it, it is a process and she's kind of, building building me back and building my confidence back again brilliant um well I, I wish you every success with that because it will be fantastic to see you really um get into 70.3 and I'm, I'm sure i've no doubt that you're going to become a huge success in that space so um maybe a trip down to swansea as well to uh to see you race that, absolutely i'm totally excited about swansea because that's where non's from as well um so literally i think the course near enough goes past where she lives so it'd be a man well well i'm disappointed i'm not right I, I nearly um signed up for swansea 70.3 and then decided to do a different race instead but i'm disappointed i'm not now because uh yeah it would have been great to see you there but um but yeah no it's been absolutely fantastic chatting to you jody thank you so much um and lots of great advice in there some of which i i need to go away and take myself by the sounds of things so um uh, you know it's been really really good to chat to you so thank you so much thank you for having me thank you If you want to find out more about Jody, best place to go to is probably jodystimpson.co.uk, but she's also very active on all social media, so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram as Jody Stimpson, and links are in the show notes. So what did you make of the conversation with Jody? Oh, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, li- living in Birmingham and uh, and hearing the uh, black country accent was always good as well. But, um, <laughs> No, Jodie's just so passionate about her sport and it's so lovely to see somebody like just the way that she was talking about that kind of racing aspect that she really kind of wants in 70.3, that kind of real kind of gritty finish and yeah, racing at the front. Um, but yeah, there's just it's just really interesting to me to hear about kind of coming from that um, kind of WTS racing into 70.3 and actually how different it is in in kind of every every way yeah it, it's um I, I i agree i think it what was lovely was when you asked what we asked her what um she was looking forward to in the future it was all about um you know finding her kind of mm. zone again in in 70.3 and it, it shows how passionate she is about the sport and how she you know she's um and it's it clearly it must be difficult changing from the short course to 70.3 you know whether it's the sponsorship element whether it be mm. you know suddenly a different approach to nutrition yeah. for something that she's done for for years yeah. Yeah. um so yeah it's um i thought that was really interesting to see how how much of a challenge that had been and actually it's really interesting to hear like because obviously a lot of professional triathletes will um train in groups won't they but she talks of it as in bubbles and how that can really obviously influence how you feel about your sport and actually probably how you grow within your sport so that really came across to me that was really interesting like different groups that she talks about and bubbles that she talks about um, yeah and you can see you see it's going from like the um uh, the itu style you know yeah. bubble to now like the, the colder uh, uh, boulder colorado type 
lifestyle of oh, more like Coldwell, is that a new place <laughs> <laughs> that's my covid <laughs> brain fog kicking in i think <laughs> Um, so yeah just that kind of more flexible dynamic way of being able to you know pick the races that you want which predominantly sound like they will be the ones that she needs to race in but yeah. the fact that she can do escape from alcatraz yeah is um is oh really that good. sounded just so fun as well didn't it i didn't realize about the run geez that sounds like the run kind of started to put me off if i'm honest <laughs> I, ran, I ran on sand for um the croyd triathlon and oh it's blowing hard work yeah i can imagine oh yeah um more so than the uh, the dunes of doom actually uh, <laughs> they weren't they weren't so bad um so uh, so yeah what else did you take from from the interview with Jodie I, I just I think it's just very interesting journey for her like really trying like the elements that she picked up on you know that you're really good at that short distance and all the success she had and now coming into slightly longer distance even down to like positioning on a t- or riding on a time trial bike. So yeah. you're really good at something and you just kind of move to slightly longer distance. And suddenly it's like relearning your body, like relearning how everything functions. And um, yeah. And how long does that take to sort of get into it? And um, so, yeah, I just found that really interesting how she's just kind of, it sounds like she's also looking at every single area of her sport again as well. Um, yeah. Like even when she talked about kind of nutrition and being really wary of injuries and having been injured and, um changing coaches like she's done everything hasn't she like overturned sort of everything yeah um, what did you make about her talking about nutrition and sort of potentially under fueling for years and and not taking electrolytes and all that sort of stuff it doesn't surprise me and that's not about doesn't surprise me about jd it doesn't surprise me in general because i think the i think the world of shorter distance as she said you know you can people do get away with it you don't you don't see as many markers as many problems arise actually within racing or after racing and actually when you go longer distance is when you start to really see those potholes like really emerge in terms of you just can't get away with it um and yeah so I it it doesn't surprise me but it doesn't that doesn't surprise me of elite and professional sport because you you know as she rightly said you're training so many hours and you know she talked about her coach knocking on the door saying you need to eat again she's like oh god I'm not ready to eat again you know because when you're training that much you you don't often have a lot of appetite either so Mm. it's I I can see how that can very naturally happen without you know but you have to have a focus on it and you have to kind of you know really think about it and it sounds like she's thinking about all of these things now in terms of you know really supporting her health to get her where she needs to be or where she wants to be we talked a bit about that with Dr. Nikki Kay, didn't we? Just yeah. um, the whole underfueling and and um, the long term impact of that. Mm-hmm. So um, so yeah, no, really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we can see her go from mm-hmm. strength well, we'll, to strength. And we'll be listening to her commentate at the Commonwealth Games. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And, so um, I'll, I'll be there as well in my volunteer capacity at Sutton Park. So. Um, Maybe not not quite near her doing the commentating, but oh, maybe you just give her give her a bit of a nudge, and you might get a guest appearance. Well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it'd be great to see her racing um, Ironman uh, Swansea seventy point three. Mm. That'll uh, I can yeah, I can see her uh, taking a win there on home soil. But um, yeah. we shall see. We shall see. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Well, that's another episode done. Um, good luck with your continued training. Thank um, you. Good. Well, I hope your recovery goes to plan as well. So be be uh, be uh, kind to yourself and take time to recover as well. I am. I'm. Uh, I'm being. Uh, yeah. So far, I'm being strict on that. As long as uh, I'm sure I will be okay. At um, but I know I'm. I'm heeding your advice and the back to returning to sport guidelines. So um, so no, that's uh, that's good advice. Um, and to everybody else, keep on training as long as you haven't got COVID, of course. And remember, this podcast was sponsored by 33 Fuel. So rethink your sports nutrition with 33 Fuel, award-winning natural sports nutrition for your performance, health, and a fitter future. It's the 33 Fuel Fuelosophy. Get yours at 33fuel.com. And if you use the discount code TRIBEATHLON or the link in the show notes, you'll get a discount at the checkout. If you enjoyed this podcast, 
please do review it and share it because it helps other people find what we think is really valuable learning lessons from amazing athletes. Um, so please do that. Um, you can also find the whole back catalogue at tribeathlon.com. And you can also find out about the Tribe Athlon app, which helps people find events, find people to train with and enjoy their events through their tribe. So check out tribeathlon.com. Thank you.